The more Studio Ghibli movies I watched, the more did the themes remind me of the works of the German philosopher Martin Heidegger. And the more I learned about Hayao Miyazaki, often considered to be one of the greatest animators of all time, the more similarities I saw with Heidegger, often to be considered the most influential philosopher of the 20th century. Their distrust of modern technology, their nostalgia for pre-capitalist rural life, their criticisms of consumerism and commodification, even their somewhat apocalyptic sentiments. So, in this video I'd like to explore Heidegger with reference to Miyazaki movies, as well as some Studio Ghibli movies more generally, mostly focusing on Heidegger's later works. In 1949, Heidegger presented one of his most famous works, The Question Concerning Technology, which, as the name implies, concerns itself with technology, but Heidegger's approach is unconventional. We tend to view technology merely as a set of tools made to achieve some goal, as a means to an end. Whether it's good or bad or what values it serves, depends entirely on the goals that it's used for. This is what Heidegger calls the anthropological or instrumental view of technology. And it's trivially true, it would be difficult to deny that technology is used as a means to an end. However, Heidegger claims, this view is quite superficial. It won't actually help us understand technology because it doesn't tell us what the essence of technology is. Now, before we go further, I should digress and warn you that Heidegger's terminology is infamously strange and sometimes incomprehensible to beginners, but there's a reason for this, beyond Heidegger just being an obscure asshole. See, Heidegger sees philosophical terms as having a kind of life of their own. We could use a visual analogy of a snowball rolling down a hill. The snowball is a philosophical term and the hill is the history of philosophy. As a concept is continually used throughout history, it gains an increasing amount of associations, assumptions, and implications, just like a snowball growing bigger as it rolls down a mountain. Whenever we use a term like subject, no matter what we intend to mean, we bring with the term an entire history of philosophical baggage, and Heidegger wanted to overcome the history of Western philosophy which he couldn't do using the very words that it's sustained by. To continue the analogy, Heidegger wants to do away with the entire outer shell of the snowball and get at what was there at the beginning. This is why he often invents terminology by combining or inventing words in his native German that do not have a specifically philosophical meaning, or ancient Greek words, back from where Western philosophy started out, when the snowball was small, so to speak. So, what is then the essence of technology? Heidegger says that in its essence, technology is a mode of revealing, das Entbergen in German, or aletheia in Greek. Heidegger translates the Greek aletheia as unclosedness or unconcealedness, but it's also the ancient Greek word for truth. For Heidegger, before we can contemplate or comprehend anything in the world, it must first reveal itself to us. Imagine a lake. In one sense, any human can look at this lake and see the same thing. However, if I am looking at the lake as a medieval peasant relaxing after a long day of farm work, it will reveal itself completely differently to me than it would if I was, say, a modern industrialist looking for a place to build a hydraulic plant. The peasant and the industrialist experience different modes of revealing. The mode of revealing one is under determines not just how one views the world, but what one considers valuable, important, worth pursuing, and even what one finds worth considering. So, what is the technological mode of revealing? How does it make things appear for us? The technological mode of revealing is in framing, or gestell in German. In framing presents everything as standing reserve, or bestand. Great, more jargon. But it will start making sense soon, I promise. 
So what the hell does it mean if something is standing reserve? Well, to see something as standing reserve is to see it as a resource, something to be utilized instrumentally, something to be harvested, exploited, something used to produce the maximum yield at the lowest cost. According to Heidegger, under the technological mode of revealing, in other words, in framing, everything in this world is to an increasing extent becoming standing reserve, even human beings. Heidegger points to the fact that the workforce comprising a company is sometimes even called, quite openly, human resources. As Heidegger writes, under in framing, the world now appears as an object open to the attacks of calculative thought. Nature becomes a gigantic gasoline station, an energy source for modern technology and industry. Heidegger believed that even the modern sciences are, in this sense, technological, because they view the world in a calculating and objectifying way. So, does this mean that Heidegger is both against technology and science as such? Is he an anarcho-primitivist? Is he a hypocrite for using a pen, a technological tool, to write this very work? Not quite. The problem for Heidegger is not just that in framing portrays everything as standing reserve, it's also that it portrays itself as the only valid or legitimate mode of revealing. It even hides the very fact that there are other modes of revealing. There is an overwhelming sense under modernity that any way of viewing the world that is not in framing, in other words, that does not reduce things either to resources to be exploited or natural forces to be calculated, is illegitimate or invalid. And framing colors all of our experiences at the expense of other modes of revealing, such as those that view the world poetically or as valuable in itself. And wouldn't this be a good way of describing what Miyazaki movies often try to do? They try to reveal the world to us not as in framing, but as something that possesses inherent beauty, something sacred, something to be in awe of. Heidegger says that modern technology challenges forth nature. What does this mean? Challenge here isn't meant positively, like some noble or rewarding challenge. It's more of an inconsiderate, unreasonable challenge. Perhaps its sense would be better captured if we said that technology coerces nature. It challenges nature in the sense that it forces it to be something it is not. It completely disregards its essence. It forces it to be transformed into mere resources, and whenever this task fails, it is nature, not technology, that is blamed and punished. When a forest is cut down for lumber faster than it can grow, that is a challenging forth. When cows are overfed to the point of being unable to move, that is a challenging forth. Challenging forth completely ignores the inherent qualities of things and compels them to become nothing but resources to be collected and stored. Heidegger contrasts challenging forth with bringing forth, or the Greek word poiesis. Sometimes Heidegger gives artisanship and craftsmanship as examples of bringing forth, and this is why, like Miyazaki, Heidegger admires certain pre-capitalist practices of production. When an artisan takes a piece of wood to carve a violin out of it, they attend to the inherent qualities of the wood. Rather than suppressing its essence like modern technology does, they bring it forth. In the process, they bring out the wood's texture, its color, its feel, all of its unique qualities. Its quirks and imperfections are brought to light. There is a kind of mutual understanding between the artist and the material. Rather than being a mere resource to be exploited, the material actually informs what the end product will be. And one sees an emphasis in Miyazaki movies on craftsmanship and artisanship. Working with one's hands is presented as something noble. And take No Face from Spirited Away, a spirit which, after entering the bathhouse, becomes insatiably hungry, showering everyone with gold in exchange for food, and eventually even swallowing people. According to IMDb, Hayao Miyazaki said in an interview that No Face is a homeless wanderer god, that in fact represents the contemporary Japan, the Japan in which people think that money will make them happy. 
It is revealed later that No Face is not inherently evil, as almost no characters are in Miyazaki movies, but rather reflects the environment that it inhabits. But most significantly for my point here, notice what No Face starts doing when it leaves the bathhouse and settles in a remote house. It starts using the spinning wheel, the quintessential example of pre-industrial hands-on production. Miyazaki's filmmaking process itself could very well be described as a bringing forth. His process is obviously very different from, for example, a board of writers working for a company trying to write a script that will be as popular and profitable as possible. This would be an inframing way of looking at the process. Usually, Miyazaki doesn't even have a script, and develops the story as he goes along. He even says, it's not me who makes the film. The film makes itself, and I have no choice but to follow. In other words, he brings forth the film. He also distrusts using computer technology, and always employs it very carefully, as he understands that certain technological implementations can have a life of their own, and shift the process towards efficiency and optimization at the expense of what is being expressed and he always insists on drawing by hand. It reminds me a bit of Heidegger's refusal to use a typewriter, as he disliked the way a typewriter homogenizes what writing looks like, and removes the distinguishing individual mark of the human hand. Of course, if inframing is the mode of revealing that defines our entire epoch, it would be unlikely to claim that Miyazaki and his studio single-handedly escape this mode of revealing. After all, they are a business. They too need to consider resources and profitability. But it is clear that this is a condition Miyazaki struggled with from the very beginning of his career. Heidegger also sees, for example, traditional windmills also as capable of bringing forth. The windmill doesn't challenge forth the wind to become a mere resource. It doesn't exhaust the wind. It only turns as much as the wind blows, and so also brings forth the inherent qualities of the wind. Heidegger writes, The revealing that holds sway throughout modern technology does not unfold into a bringing forth in the sense of poiesis. The revealing that rules in modern technology is a challenging, which puts to nature the unreasonable demand that it supply energy that can be extracted and stored as such. But does this not hold true for the old windmill as well? No. Its sails do indeed turn in the wind. They are left entirely to the wind's blowing. But the windmill does not unlock energy from the air currents in order to store it. And this is very interesting because Miyazaki often emphasizes wind-powered technology. The leading characters often use aircraft that requires a minimum amount of technology, and is in Heideggerian terms brought forth by the wind. For example, the gliders in Nausicaa and Castle in the Sky, or Kiki's Broomstick. On the other hand, jets and rockets are associated with the military and the evils of war. Windmills are central to the valley Nausicaa lives in, an area that has a more reciprocal relationship with nature than that of the Tolmikians. And this is even more significant in the introductory sequence in Castle in the Sky. The wind is personified as some kind of deity, and gives the first push that powers the first windmill, which grows increasingly more complex and proliferates until the technology passes a certain threshold, becomes disconnected from the earth, and clouds the sky with smoke. Then, some sort of calamity occurs, and we return to the beginning again, to the wind god and the most basic type of windmill. This sequence almost seems to present a kind of deterministic view of technological development. In the first windmill that appears, the seeds of future technological destruction are already sowed. This is very similar to Heidegger, who views the history of Western philosophy as a kind of decline, an increasing forgetting of being, and an increasing objectification of the world. One could say it's a regressive view of history, the opposite of a progressive view of history of the kind that, for example, Hegel has. But neither of them are completely pessimistic. Heidegger believed that in the destructive power of technology would also lie something that might save us. And at the end of the sequence, when we're back to the beginning, 
back to the most basic kind of windmill, the scene is a bit different. This time, Shita is standing next to an animal and running water. Perhaps this signifies a more reciprocal relationship with nature, and if things are different this time, there is a possibility that the course of events may be changed and technological disaster avoided. I should stress again that as anti-technology as Heidegger may initially seem, he does not denounce technology outright, just like Miyazaki. To him, to simply do away with technology would be, paradoxically, a technological act itself, because it assumes that we are conquerors standing over and against technology, deciding to do away with it according to whether it has utility for us or not. Heidegger believes that we must gain what he calls a free relation to technology, and this is something that the main characters struggle with throughout the entirety of Castle in the Sky. Unsurprisingly, Heidegger speaks very nostalgically of rural life in general. The pre-modern peasant, for example, does not challenge forth the soil the way modern agriculture does, but rather cares for it and maintains it. The peasant must attend to the needs of the soil, adapt to the changes in weather, and wait patiently for the right season. There is a mutual understanding between the peasant and the soil, just as there is between the artisan and the material they use. And this is thematized in the Ghibli movie Only Yesterday, where Tokyo is contrasted with the rural life of the peasant, who works with one's own hands. <laughs> Heidegger says that with modern technology, a tract of land is challenged into the putting out of coal and ore. The earth now reveals itself as a coal mining district, the soil as a mineral deposit. The field that the peasant formerly cultivated and set in order appears differently than it did when to set in order still meant to take care of and to maintain. The work of the peasant does not challenge the soil of the field. In the sowing of the grain, it places the seed in the keeping of the forces of growth and watches over its increase. But meanwhile, even the cultivation of the field has come under the grip of another kind of setting in order, which sets upon nature. It sets upon it in the sense of challenging it. Agriculture is now the mechanized food industry. Air is now set upon to yield nitrogen the earth to yield ore, or to yield uranium, for example. This contrast between bringing forth and challenging forth is probably thematized the most explicitly in Princess Mononoke, where nature and traditional ways of living are set against industrialization and the extraction of resources. As the official Princess Mononoke website explained, Miyazaki wanted to portray the very beginnings of the seemingly insoluble conflict between the natural world and modern industrial civilization. The leader of the industrial Iron Town is not evil. In fact, she is presented as quite caring and reasonable. But the mode of revealing that holds sway in Iron Town, namely in framing, makes her unable to see the sacredness of the forest. The forest becomes something to be challenged forth cut down for resources. Even the great forest spirit is seen as a resource to be hunted down, and the rest of the spirits to be exterminated if they interfere. This is also thematized in Nausicaa of the Valley of the Wind. In it, the Tolmikians see the world as standing reserve, and they challenge forth the poisoned forest and the creatures that protect it, planning to destroy it by using weapons of mass destruction. On the other hand, Princess Nausicaa from the Valley of the Wind has a reciprocal relationship with nature. She understands that in order to form a healthy relationship with it, one must attend to it, and throughout the movie she is constantly trying to understand what its needs are. As Jodi Bonici writes in the paper Ethics Animated, the serenity and light and earthy tones in Nausicaa's underground lab symbolize the poesis of bringing forth into unconcealment while the dark and gruesome imagery in Officer Kurotoa's lab symbolizes a challenging forth, which sets upon nature and attempts to command it into standing by to be called upon for further commands. In 1951, 
Heidegger wrote the essay Building Dwelling Thinking. In it, he claims that mortals dwell by safeguarding the fourfold. Well, duh, of course they do. But what does this mean? First off, notice how Heidegger uses the word mortals, rather than a more conventional philosophical term. First of all, this is a word that has a deeper emotional significance for people than a word like subject or man would have, because he's going against the philosophical tradition that wants to turn everything into a matter of cold, disinterested observation. This is why Heidegger often writes in a semi-poetical manner, struggling not to reveal the world in the manner of enframing. Secondly, it emphasizes our mortality, our essential finitude. The modern philosophical tradition tended to overlook or obscure this fact, instead emphasizing our rationality, or seeing us as subjects conquering a world of objects. Heidegger instead emphasizes that we are essentially finite, that we can't know or conquer everything, and that one day we will die. For him, life loses meaning if you try to forget or avoid the fact that you will one day die, and obscuring this fact only saps the significance that our activities have for us. Secondly, notice that he uses the word dwell rather than simply live or exist. The word dwelling emphasizes that we live somewhere, in a given place, a given culture, a given area, a given realm of possibilities. We are essentially contextual beings. From the moment we are born, our surroundings necessarily shape who we essentially are. This might seem obvious, but the modern philosophical tradition has usually tried to think of the subject, the human being, in abstraction from such contexts. In general, Philosophy has often tried to focus on problems in abstraction from time and space, but Heidegger emphasizes that without being embedded in some meaningful context, philosophy would not be possible at all. He even believes that this drive to abstract from the localities we inhabit is one of the causes of the lack of meaning in modernity. We are increasingly surrounded by places completely devoid of any meaning or significance for us, Gas stations, malls, mass housing apartments, airports, or office buildings. Places that have no history or culture. Places that we don't really care about. Places that are, in a sense, abstracted from context because they are copy-pasted anywhere and everywhere. Notice how Heidegger is connecting these abstract philosophical issues that seem to be completely irrelevant in our daily lives and connecting them to our daily experiences, this is a theme that runs throughout his entire corpus. In opposition to the meaningless spaces of modernity, Miyazaki emphasizes places that look unique and lived in, dwelled in, to be more exact, places in which centuries of history and culture reveal themselves, which are presented with awe and reverence. Finally, there's the most important part of the claim, the fourfold. The fourfold consists of earth, on the other side of which is sky, and mortals, on the other side of which are divinities. These four elements, which all presuppose one another, are the things that human beings must respect and safeguard in order to dwell, in other words, in order to live meaningfully. Let's take them one by one. First, the earth. Earth is the serving bearer, blossoming and fruiting, spreading out in rock and water, rising up into plant and animal. In other words, the earth is the ground, both literally and metaphorically, of all of our daily activities, whether it's the soil from which we grow food, the forest path we walk through, or the rock that we sculpt. When we dwell, these are all things that not only make our daily activities possible, they make them feel grounded and meaningful. But under modernity, we prefer to cover the ground up, to disregard and to disrespect the earth. In Castle in the Sky, the floating castle Laputa quite literally becomes disconnected from the earth, and this leads to its eventual abandonment. The inhabitants forget their intimate connection to the earth, and overly rely on technology. Secondly, the sky. The sky is the vaulting path of the sun, the course of the changing moon, the wandering glitter of the stars, the year seasons and their changes, the light and dusk of day, the gloom and glow of night, the clemency and inclemency of the weather, 
the drifting clouds and blue depth of the ether. So the sky, on the other hand, is what makes our activities comprehensible and ordered. The day tells us when to wake up, while the night tells us when to sleep. The seasons tell us when to celebrate, and the weather tells us what to grow and what to build. This kind of naturally ordered temporality is also forgotten under modernity, with things like 24-7 services and entertainment. This also features in Castle in the Sky. As you remember, the introductory sequence shows the sky being clouded with smoke, something which precedes the catastrophe which leads to the abandonment of Laputa. So, in Castle in the Sky, the failure of Laputa is a failure to dwell, a failure to safeguard both earth and sky. Next, we have the mortals. The mortals are the human beings. They are called mortals because they can die. To die means to be capable of death as death. Only man dies, and indeed continually, as long as he remains on earth, under the sky, before the divinities. As I already said, the use of mortals emphasizes our finitude, but also the meaningfulness of this finitude. Heidegger says that only human beings are mortals because only human beings die. An animal merely perishes. This is because our death is something we expect and anticipate, as well as something we honor. It's not difficult to imagine what Heidegger would think about those who wish to use technology to make themselves immortal. For him, it would be just another example of the modern inability to dwell. And finally, the divinities. The divinities are the beckoning messengers of the Godhead. Out of the holy sway of the Godhead, the god appears in his presence, or withdraws into his concealment. Now this part has often been pushed aside, or deemed unimportant, because of how much any kind of sense of the divine has disappeared from the modern West. In fact, one of the ways in which Heidegger describes modernity is the loss of gods. But he doesn't mean that this will be solved simply by believing that God exists. He disliked what had become of the Christian god, particularly in theology. God became less something that you revere, and more an abstract entity posited to solve philosophical problems. God itself became viewed in a technological way, as something to be objectified and calculated. Heidegger sees the development of Western metaphysics, the enframing mode of revealing, and Christian-slash-Platonic theology as going hand in hand. So what Heidegger misses is not simply faith, but a sense of the divine in our everyday lives. Just as the presence of the earth presupposes the sky, so the presence of mortals presupposes divinities, something that is beyond our complete understanding, something mysterious. In our urge to forget our own finitude, to calculate, objectify, and conquer everything, we've sapped life of this quality of divine mystery. But this is precisely the kind of mystery that many Miyazaki movies evoke, and this is because of the influence that Shinto has had on Miyazaki. Shinto is a Japanese religious practice older than historical records, but one of its main features is that kami, the spirits or gods, are not transcendent in another realm of existence like the platonic slash Christian god, but imminent to shrines and natural objects. Miyazaki has said that the animism of Shinto is something deeply embedded in him, and this shows up most clearly in the forest spirits in Totoro and Princess Mononoke, as well as the countless shrines that appear in Miyazaki movies. The practice of Shinto is actually a wonderful concrete example of what Heidegger's sense of divinities might look like in practice. This is because the spirits in Shinto are something imminent to the everyday. They inhabit one's daily life. When, for example, one gives a rice offering to a spirit inhabiting a shrine, the four elements come together in a simple unity. The earth provides the soil from which the rise grows, the sky provides the rain and the climate, and the mortal is connected with the divinity in the act of offering. Edward McDougall writes, This differs fundamentally from a Christian church, in that the church is made sacred by its relationship to a higher transcendental realm that is not attached to any particular place. In Shinto, it is the unique place that is itself important. Sokyo Ono writes that in Shinto, 
Shrines themselves cannot be considered without some relation to the natural beauty which traditionally has surrounded them. Shrine worship is closely associated with a keen sense of the beautiful, a mystic sense of nature. Thomas Sekulis adds that Shinto practice is often more to make one feel at home with awe rather than try to understand or control it. And Edward McDougall connects this back to Heidegger. The shrine thus provides a focal point that bears a deep resemblance to Heidegger's The Thing as a place in which nearness preserves farness. The presence of the kami, remaining completely beyond human understanding, while embedded within an everyday setting. In other words, Shinto emphasizes engagement rather than a Christian kind of detachment or resignation. The practice is seen as more important than a particular set of beliefs. So if Castle in the Sky then portrays the failure to safeguard earth and sky, Princess Mononoke portrays the failure to safeguard divinities, a failure to see the sacred in the everyday. And spirited away, Haku wears an outfit called a Hakama, a type of outfit that is worn, among others, by Shinto priests. Eventually it is revealed that, and this is the only spoiler in the video, so mute the audio for just 15 seconds if you'd like to avoid it. It is revealed that he is a river spirit that previously occupied the Kohaku River, but the river was filled in and replaced with apartment buildings, causing Haku to forget his real name an example of divinities being forgotten due to inframing. And the Shinto themes come up even in the relatively light-hearted Ghibli movie Pompoko, which tells the story of Japanese raccoon dogs fighting back against industrialization, a challenging fourth that is destroying nature and sacred areas. So now with our knowledge of the fourfold, we can, for example, take the crystal that Shita wears as a necklace and castle in the sky. To the military which seek it, the crystal is merely standing reserve, a resource to be challenged forth for political or economic ends. But to Shida, it's the kind of item that Heidegger would call a thing, an item with a certain significance that preserves the fourfold in its unity. It's imbued with the earth, the mines from which the crystal was mined, the sky where the crystal unleashes its power and where the castle that gave the crystal its history was located, and the divinities which reside in the crystal's mystery and power. When one dwells, when one's life and activities are meaningful, even simple everyday items like a wine jug or a teacup can unite the fourfold. They can be imbued with such a significance in ceremonies and rituals. And this is the sense of divinity that our world lacks. Some of my viewers might roll their eyes at Heidegger's poetic musings and ask, isn't he just a bitter old man upset about the fact that the new world doesn't match the world of his idealized nostalgia? And there have been theorists who argue that Heidegger's work is beset by an inappropriate nostalgia. Heidegger grew up in a small German town, an extremely rural and conservative area, one that was very different from the city of Freiburg that he would end up teaching in. And he did always remain nostalgic about rural life, often retreating into a remote hut in the so-called Black Forest, where he wrote some of his works. It's like Nietzsche said, every great philosophy so far has been the personal confession of its author, and a kind of involuntary and unconscious memoir. And the kind of nostalgia Heidegger experienced can be dangerous and misleading. Heidegger ended up joining the Nazi party, partly because their emphasis on tradition and rural German life appealed to his nostalgia. Of course, he later had to admit, however reluctantly, that the Nazi party did not overcome the modern technological condition like he thought they would. To the contrary, it was a particularly brutal and grotesque manifestation of everything Heidegger criticized in technology. Miyazaki himself, is self-admittedly a nostalgic person. Nostalgic about the pre-industrial, pre-consumerist Japan. He also recalls being a frustrated child in the mid-50s to mid-60s because, as he says, nature, the mountains and rivers, was being destroyed in the name of economic progress. And the prominence of aircraft in his movies is partly due to the nostalgia he has for his childhood when his father was an airplane manufacturer. 
one does not have to be nostalgic to see, like Heidegger and Miyazaki did, that throughout the course of industrial development, something valuable was lost, something important was devalued. And that something is what Miyazaki is always trying to grasp. I don't know if it's possible, but I can only hope that this kind of nostalgia can be transformed into a hope for a better future, into what Heidegger would call a free relation to technology. Man kann deshalb dieses Denken und das Glauben nicht abschaffen, weil das Wesen des Menschen endlich ist. Weil der Mensch seinem Wesen nach immer zu neuen Versuchen genötigt ist. Und gerade in der jetzigen Zeit würde ich meinen, indem ich auf die erste Frage zurückgehe, dass die Besinnung darauf, was und wer der Mensch sei, nötig ist, heute, wo die Gefahr besteht, dass der Mensch ganz der Technik ausgeliefert wird und eines Tages zu einer gesteuerten Maschine gemacht wird. And now I'd like to thank my patrons, my human resources, who I view as mere standing reserve. Apply Quine that doesn't work on 37th Call, a pronounceable name, Andreas Waller Rosshole, Andre Oliva, Christopher, Clark Fletcher, Dancing Vulture, Dasan, Evie Rosk, Ian Dent, Edison Hua, Elliot Rosenstock, Ethan Hastings, Finlay, Gary Coulter, George Soros, Greg Boyarko, Gub Gub Kol Kol, Heraklion, as in Heracles, I just wet myself. I love Vosh, Juke Slag, Justin Armijo, Jurgen Lips, Capsi, Kelly Rankin, M. Lim, Malkavian Madness, Markle Pax, Mad Gold, Meme Manifest, Mr. Snickers, Nathaniel Lark, Nicholas Pash, Noble Drew Thomas, Abdullah Okolan says donate to Havis or Polcat. Rachel Ann, Republic of Chad, Robert Seals, Sarah Sitkin, Sebastian Roll, Syntax88, Sweet Injections, Sin Kion Bresgal, Tendies123, Theodore Sandel Rolfsen, Trevor Stevenson, Ukendoka, Wi Fi, Yaiman Shi, Zim, as well as all of these standing reserves. This was a really difficult video to write, both because Heidegger is such a difficult thinker to explain and there's so many different interpretations, but also because Miyazaki's movies are so full of content and things to analyze that I could really talk about it for hours. But I hope you enjoyed it either way. Happy holidays. Thank you.